This is CBC Here and Now. Forget a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. All the Star Wars action is right here, right now at the Avalon Mall Cineplex tonight. It's the end of a sci-fi era, and we'll speak with some hardcore fans coming up. Back in this galaxy, welcome to Here and Now. I'm Anthony Germain. Premier Dwight Ball says he's ready for a leadership challenge whenever the Liberal Party wants to hold it. Here and Now has learned that an attempt by Ball's supporters to delay next year's leadership review in mid-June and move it to June of 2021 has failed. At a meeting of the Liberal Executive on Wednesday, the party solidly voted to keep the leadership review this coming June instead of overriding the party's constitution and buying the Premier some more time. Ball loyalists attempted to compromise by moving the review to the back half of 2020, but the party would have none of it. In a year-end interview with me recorded just about an hour ago, Ball says he's ready for a leadership review right now. I'm ready for the review in February. That would be my response. I'm ready for this. This is something that we knew was coming. This is part of a, a very progressive constitution that only the Liberal Party in Newfoundland and Labrador would have. I've been through two reviews already, been through two elections, and had a very extensive leadership challenge in, in 2013 when we was widely contested and came out of that. So not afraid of reviews or not afraid at all to take on but the challenge. Why, why would people loyal to you, such as the president, John Allen, and Rodney Mercer, why would they have a motion to move it? I wasn't at that table. Right. Uh, they make decisions, but certainly not on my requests at all. I'm ready to go for a leadership challenge at any point. So you'd be okay to have one in February? I'm ready to have one this weekend if they wanted to. It's now Ball says his next priority is passing a provincial budget this spring. And in a minority government, passing a budget means getting support from members of other political parties as well as independent MHAs. And if he doesn't get that support, the Premier says he is ready to go to the polls in another election. So you're actually willing, if, if you can't get what you think is the right budget for the province through, you're willing, you're willing to go to the polls? I mean, obviously, parliamentary procedure means you have to if you get defeated, but that means you would not have to face a leadership review. We could just go to the polls. I'm not at all about whatever the review is. If, it's a pub, if the opposition parties decided that they want an election on, based on our budget, we'll go to the people of this province. And instead of letting 40 people decide, we'll let some 500,000 people decide on what the future is for Newfoundland and Labrador. I will not back, I don't back down from challenges. As long as I'm making a difference, I'll be Premier of this province. And by the way, we'll bring you uh, that year-end review, interview rather, with the Premier in two parts on Here and Now next week on Monday and Tuesday. We talked about a number of things, uh, the Carla Foot affair, as well as immigration, some surprising comments from the Premier on that, a whole bunch of topics, and of course, the state of our finances. And there was a stark warning today from this province's Auditor General. Julia Mullally is warning the government is spending too much money. All that overspending has driven our net debt to the highest levels ever, more than $15 billion. That's almost $30,000 for every single person. The province plans to get to surplus within four years. In the last decade, government spending has skyrocketed. It's up more than $2 billion. The province is facing a very significant uh, financial situation. It, it is challenging. And, um, you know, and unless we're able to address some of our issues on the expenditure side, um, you know, uh, we will continue to have deficits and we'll continue to grow our net debt. Um, and, and that's not positive for the future generations. So, you know, I think that, uh, uh, you know, there's still upside potential, obviously. We, you know, um, here in the province and, and we have, uh, you know, great offshore, we have other sectors. So, you know, there's opportunities. You don't want it to be all doom and gloom. But, you know, for sure, uh, I don't think that it's, uh, you know, uh, I think it's important that everybody understands that the province is facing a very significant financial challenge. Um, there are no easy solutions. I don't, I'm not saying that there are, um, but I think we absolutely need to look to government to, to see um, how we can uh, better, um, better manage the, the expenditure side and bring it to a more sustainable. 
Well, the Offshore Petroleum Board has shut down operations on the Terra Nova rig after issues were flagged with its fire prevention systems. According to the CNLOPB, the vessel does not have backup water pump systems on board in case of a fire, and that violates a safety requirement under the regulations. Notice was given today and Suncor was ordered to suspend its operations. The CNLOPB says that suspension will stay until the operator addresses the matter properly. Well, there's everything from jammed vibrating condensers to complex computer software that keeps getting delayed. The problems are adding up for the troubled Muskrat Falls project. Now, these issues are, are not new, but recent letters from NL Hydro to the Public Utilities Board paint a picture of just how big those headaches have become. The focus of problems now is the Labrador Island link. That's the line that's going to bring Labrador power to the Avalon Peninsula. General Electric was supposed to deliver interim operating software for the link this month, but that's now delayed until January and possibly longer, according to documents. It's the latest of many setbacks for this contract. And there's a serious problem here at Soldiers Pond. Three new synchronous condensers. They help keep the system stable, but they're not working properly, and experts are scrambling to try to find the cause of that problem. The Natural Resources Minister says issues such as these are to be expected in the commissioning process for such a complex project. We're concerned about uh, making sure that the Labrador Island link is functional. Uh, I do anticipate uh, an update after Christmas of uh, having that, uh, uh, that process, the start of that process. Right now, I asked Mr. Marshall as recently as Friday past, are we still, are we still on the schedule? Are we still on the path that, you know, that, we, that, that he has set forward and he has advised me that we are? Nonetheless, the clock is ticking and it's growing increasingly unlikely that Labrador Power will be able to displace oil-fired Holyrood electricity over this winter, and perhaps even next winter, according to experts hired by the PUB. Well, temperatures today up through Labrador, especially along the coast, sitting in the single digits above zero and that uh, warmer mild air I should say is uh, headed towards the island as we head through the day tomorrow. We do have a, a little bit of a warm front moving through. It's bringing some heavy snow for southeastern portions of the coast of Labrador and then the northern peninsula as well. That's going to continue to move across the island as we head into tomorrow bringing some accumulating snow. I'll have all those details coming up. Thanks, Ashley. Well, today is a massive day for Star Wars fans. The last movie in the saga is opening in movie theaters across Canada, and that includes right here in St. John's. And as you can see, the force is with us. Carolyn Stokes is at the Cineplex <laughs> at the Avalon Mall. Carolyn. Thanks, Anthony. First of all, I just want to set the mood. <laughs> can you hear that? <laughs> It is the, one of the most iconic movie themes of all time. And no matter how old you are, really, this song must trigger some nostalgia. And for hardcore sci-fi fans, especially Star Wars, it's practically an anthem. And there are a lot of those fans here tonight at the Avalon Mall because it's the end of a sci-fi era, the last of the Star Wars films premiering tonight at the Avalon Mall. Uh, the Rise of Skywalker begins at 6 o'clock, so it's 6.07 now. There are a few minutes in, and because of Newfoundland's unique time zone, we are the first to get to see this movie. We're at least uh, 30 minutes before everyone else in the country. So earlier, a short time ago, I spoke with some of those hardcore fans as they were heading in to see the film. You must be a pretty big Star Wars fan. I am, yes. I've watched it since I was a kid. I used to go to the theater all the time with my dad, actually. And he's the one who helped me uh, build this costume. You built this costume? Yep, right from scratch. So what is it about Star Wars that you love so much? Just uh, like the story, the characters. So whenever I go see a Star Wars movie, it's kind of nostalgic. It brings me back to when we used to go see it when I was a kid. And what are your expectations for this movie tonight? I honestly have no idea where this is going to go. So I, I'm, I've heard bad things, but I've also heard really good things. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping it lives up to the hype. So how do you feel about the fact that this is the finale? This is the last one in the saga. That's just a Skywalker saga. Star Wars is forever. 
I mean, you got Mandalorian on TV and everything. Mm -hmm. Everybody's going nuts over Baby Yoda. So do you want to do a Star Wars quiz with me? When gone am I, the last of the Jedi, will you be? I'm pretty sure that's Yoda. Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. You're my only hope. Princess Leia again, a new hope via the R2 unit. Okay, and how about this one? I find your lack of faith disturbing. I'm Darth Vader. Yep, that's it. <laughs> that was a clip. Why you stuck up, half-witted, scruffy-looking nerf herder. Leia to Han Solo, bring Empire Strikes back. These aren't the droids you are looking for. Oh, that is Obi-Wan Kenobi. Hey, you're really, you know all this. <laughs> Last one, probably the easiest. No, I am your father. Vader, and first respect to Luke. You, when gone am I, the last of the Jedi will you be. You must see this droid safely delivered to him on Alderaan. This is our most desperate hour. Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. You're my only hope. Your sad devotion to that ancient religion has not helped you conjure up the stolen data tapes, or given you clairvoyance enough to find the rebels' hidden fort. I find your lack of faith disturbing. Why, you stuck up, half-witted, scruffy-looking nerf herder! Let me see your identification. You don't need to see his identification. These aren't the droids you're looking for. These aren't the droids we're looking for. Obi-Wan never told you what happened to your father. He told me enough. He told me you killed him. No. I am your father. So classic. Now, admittedly, I did give them some pretty uh, easy ones for sure. And just to note, the reason you didn't see uh, the face of the Mandalorian is because in true Mandalorian fashion, he didn't want to remove his helmet. He couldn't. So he didn't. Anyways, uh, if you're not one of the lucky ones in here tonight to see the six o'clock showing, no fear. There are many, many other showings. There's actually 10 more tonight alone here at the Avalon Mall. Reporting live for here and now, I'm Carolyn Stokes. We're turning now to other news. It's going to be the new year before a decision is made in the trial of a former police officer charged with making indecent phone calls. The lawyer representing former RNC officer Sean Kelly says all the evidence in the case is circumstantial. Robbie Ash presented his final summation in Cornerbrook Court this morning. It's the latest charge against Kelly, who was convicted of a similar charge in February of 2015. Ash argued there are inconsistencies in testimony and phone records that were provided. He also argued that Kelly and the woman were acquaintances, saying if Kelly was in fact making anonymous indecent phone calls, the woman would have recognized his voice. Well, the Crown disagreed, and the judge will render her decision in early February. Well, as if a fire wasn't enough to deal with, members of a church in Grand Falls, Windsor, are facing more obstacles in reopening their building. Someone stole power tools from the site this week. St. Matthew's Presbyterian Church, the oldest church in Grand Falls, Windsor, was extensively damaged by fire in October. Well, the main structure was saved, but major smoke and water damage meant that it couldn't reopen. And three days ago, the news got even worse. About $3,000 worth of power tools were stolen from the church. And volunteers had donated their tools as well as their time to help rebuild. The thieves likely got in by breaking a basement window. And security footage shows someone making about five return trips back and forth to the church at around 6 o'clock on Monday morning. Well, to a better church story now, for one St. John's church, this holiday season is going to be extra special. And that's because last year, a key Christmas character rose, and I mean key, returned and was then gone again. Here now is Mark Quinn has the update. Last year, this manger outside Corpus Christi Church was a crime scene. The baby Jesus was stolen right out of his crib, not once, but twice. Police were called in and they found him once, but then the figure disappeared again. 
A year later, there are still some unanswered questions. Who took it? Or for whatever reason it disappeared? We have no idea. This fall, after Jesus had been missing for months, some were beginning to lose hope. We assumed that he was gone, gone for good. But that changed recently when a church worker made a surprise discovery. He came in and said, the baby Jesus returned. I said, great. But that's how we know that it was, we, we found it on the steps of the church. It was the exact same ceramic baby Jesus that went missing, and it was completely undamaged. Barton isn't angry or upset. In fact, he's grateful. There's a sense of joy and peace, and that there is, there is goodness out there. Exactly where baby Jesus went twice is still a mystery, and it may remain one forever. But the church is just glad he's back in good shape, and they hope he's here to stay. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. Well, here now this week, we've been bringing you stories from Little Bay Islands. The isolated Notre Dame community has decided to resettle. It's been very divisive for a lot of people who spent most of their lives there. But the government shutting her down. The school, stores, power, and the ferry service, they'll all be gone soon. And about a week from now, the Hazel McIsaac is going to stop servicing Little Bay Islands altogether. But just east in Long Island, residents hope to take advantage of that freed up ferry. And that includes one woman who decided to return home to Notre Dame Bay after 50 years of living in Toronto. I lived in Ontario for 50 odd years. I worked there, I brought up a family. I have two girls and six grandchildren. And when my youngest grandchildren turned seven, I said, that's it, I'm going home. And I came home because I've missed it my whole life. Well, I guess if you're, you're leaving your grandkids and your daughters and all that, you must have really wanted to come back. Absolutely. My whole life I wanted to come back. Why is that? Can you explain the, the, the pull? It's Newfoundland. <laughs> I mean, this is Long Island. What's not to love? I lived all over around the GTA and nothing, even the cottage country does not compare to home. The greater Toronto area has, what, 5 million plus? Yeah. And what, we have 160 people 160, here. 160 odd people and uh, that's what I love. It's like a big family here. I like the fact that everyone helps everyone out. Anytime there's uh, any kind of a situation like a funeral, uh, any kind of social gatherings, everyone on the island pitches in. Like the meals after funerals are all made by local women. We all pitch in and serve the food, cook the food, serve the food, clean it up. It's an amazing uh, community to live in. It's just like one, like I said, like a big family. And Millie, you've watched what's unfolded in Little Bay Islands with that community basically voting itself out of existence and yeah. huge divisions about getting compensation and money for leaving. Do you have any fears that, that would happen here? Um, I don't think it will in my lifetime, but if it does, I'll be doing what Mike Parsons did. You're going to be staying? Yeah. <laughs> I won't be leaving this island, no way. I came here to spend the rest of my life and um, I look after the cemetery that I plan on being planted in. And uh, that's, that's, that's my goal, to, to stay here until I pass away. I've already had three grandchildren and one daughter this year. And, um, but like I just came last fall, basically. So I hope to have my whole family here soon, you know, every summer. They'll be coming and, you know, I, they have somewhere to go that's real, you know, as opposed to the city. This is outdoors Canada, and this is the most beautiful place in the world as far as I'm concerned. I think it was very jolly. I think it was fun, and I feel really happy that I did it now. Finding your inner voice. A group of singers in St. John's is getting a lot of attention. That's ahead on Here and Now. We'll bring you a holiday performance from this deaf choir.
Welcome back to the program. First, we start with breaking news. Temperatures are dropping into the minus single digits. Time now to check in with our Carolyn Stokes. It is just packed with people. The company says it's picking up salmon. Looks like an absolutely gorgeous afternoon. Okay, well, some people got to experience uh, slightly milder temperatures today. Yep. Right. Yeah, and on the coast of Labrador, mm -hmm. and uh, actually saw some rain today. Uh, that mild air that we talked about yesterday, bringing in uh, some of the milder temperatures from the really off the coast of Newfoundland okay. and yeah. Labrador. So uh, that certainly happened. Let's take a look at those temperatures today, sitting around one degree for uh, Hopedale and Makovic. Same thing as Cartwright. So pretty much anywhere along the coast. Your temperatures should actually be sitting around minus seven, minus eight is your daytime temperature. So you're a little bit above zero or a little bit above the um, normal there. And otherwise we're sitting in the minus single digits across most of the island. Now, this warmer air is going to start to move a little bit further south, and that's because we've got an area of low pressure. It's spinning and bringing uh, that onshore flow. So as we start to see that warm front move a little bit further south, the snow that's happening up through the southeast coast of Labrador, you can see it there on the future tracker, is going to continue uh, along the Great Northern Peninsula and the west coast, as well as uh, really anywhere in the Green Bay, White Bay, Bay area, and that's going to head further east and south as we head through the night tonight. Now temperature wise, uh, sitting in the minus single digits, minus uh, nine for Grand Falls, Windsor, and those winds will eventually pick up. They've been pretty uh, quiet for the past couple of days, but we will start to see those winds ramp up. Uh, Northwesterly, west northwesterly is 30 to 50 kilometers per hour as we head through the night tonight and then up through Labrador. Uh, temperatures will dip, so what we're seeing as far as rain will change over more than likely to uh, some flurries, maybe even some freezing drizzle. And then again, the southern half of uh, or at least the southeast portion of Labrador, you're looking at uh, some significant snowfall continuing tonight. So here's a look at what uh, the models are saying right now. Uh, Northern Peninsula, you could pick up as much as 15 to 20 centimeters of snow by the time tomorrow morning rolls around. And then that snow will continue to track a little bit further east, uh, making it to the metro area likely in the morning hours. But again, those winds are going to ramp up with this system. So we're looking, uh, especially along the northeast coast, you could see gusts upwards of about 80 kilometers per hour and then that snow will move through. Uh, certainly by supper time, we uh, are looking at some snow across the island and we could even see some slick conditions out on the road, certainly with some of this snow. Right now, as far as uh, the amounts go, likely thinking a two to maybe five centimeters of snow for the metro area. Higher elevations, you could see pockets of about five to 10 centimeters, but the majority of that snow will fall across the west coast and then uh, along the northeast coast, even because we're seeing some rain up through Labrador, there is a potential that along the coast we could see some of that rain as well. So here's your temperatures, uh, zero to one degree, maybe a little bit below, pretty much is where we'll be sitting across most of the island. And uh, those winds, again, westerlies 30 to 50 kilometers per hour. Along the west coast, though, a little less and out of the north, generally uh, 20 to 40 kilometers per hour. Up through Labrador, you're going to hang on to these milder temperatures down along the southeastern portion of the coast, uh, but up through Nain, sunshine will return minus two. So you're still sitting above uh, the above normal for this time of year in Lab City. You're going to be sitting around minus eight. The further west you go, the less chance of flurries, but you're still going to see that chance through the day. So that's a look at your forecast for Friday. We'll look ahead to the weekend coming up. Well, have you ever seen someone singing in sign language? When St. John's, a deaf choir is turning heads and warming hearts with performances right around the city. And choir members say they're having fun and they're also giving the deaf community a much bigger voice. Here now, Zach Gowdy has the story with some assistance from interpreter Heather Crane. Even if you don't communicate in sign language, you can still hear the deaf choir. An afternoon at the St. John's Airport, travelers are treated to a surprise performance. A Christmas classic, but done by the deaf choir, it feels brand new. Weeks earlier, the choir squeezes into a small classroom at the Association of the Deaf Offices in St. John's. 
rehearsal night. You can sing or you can play the trombone. Ultimately, you want to be a musician. And what we've created here are musicians. Choir director Leanne Ryan has never done anything like this before. But then, neither has anyone else. It's like nothing I've ever actually seen because I've been involved in music, I've been involved in theater, I've been involved in dance, and Deaf Choir kind of takes all of that and puts it all into one beautiful package. That's because singing in sign language is different from speaking in sign language, as different as singing and speaking with your voice. It is really different, actually. In singing, you've got so much more expressions and movement and actions involved to get the point across. The choir also helps to get another point across about what deaf people can do. I wanted to spread deaf uh, awareness to the hearing community to, to realize that deaf people can do the same. This September, the Association of the Deaf produced a video for Deaf Awareness Month. A key scene features a flash mob of deaf people coming together at the rooms and performing in sign language. The flash mobbers practiced hard, shot the video, and it was a big hit. Everyone was happy. But then a funny thing happened. At the Association of the Deaf, the phone started ringing. People were asking, does the deaf choir do gigs? The next month, the group was together again, this time on stage at Mount Pearl Senior High. They started to realize that they had something bigger than a flash mob on their hands. And it just became something that was so much larger than we started off with. And you, we can't stop now. It's not just about the music. For the choir members, it's about each other. 11-year-old Alexandra Garafa has cochlear implants to help her hear, but she still uses sign language and feels like she's part of the deaf community. Well, it feels different because I get to learn a lot more sign language than I used to do when I was younger. And it's nice being a part of like a lot of other people who know how to sign and I feel more comfortable along with them. I think it's absolutely fabulous. Uh, it feels wonderful, you know. It's very inspirational to show who we are and that we are the deaf community here in Newfoundland and Labrador. The choir gathers at the airport for its next gig, shooting a Christmas video with the group Play Piano NL. The young musicians provide the melody and the choir sings along. Passers-by stop in their tracks, their travels on hold, while they take in a moment of holiday magic. Oh, it was awesome. Oh my goodness. It was a f I'm full of Christmas spirit here today. It was very exciting. I, I'm, it was amazing, I must say. Oh, I feel uh, fabulous, very inspiring, you know, to teach deaf awareness here in the public. Uh, it means that we know we're here. We're part of the public. I think it was very jolly, I think it was fun, and I feel really happy that I did it now. The Deaf Choir is sticking together and looking forward to performing again. And if you get a chance to see them, make sure you take the time to listen. Zach Gowdy, CBC News, St. John's. Well, what's a Christmas party without mummers? We're going to join some new Canadians as they're planking her down.
Um, personally, I feel a warm meal is being able to um, stay together with family and share a very delicious meal on a Christmas day. Yeah. The food bank does a really important job, especially in the holidays, to have people, have everybody enjoy that Christmas spirit. A warm meal means comfort. Uh, a warm meal means a full belly. Yeah, a warm meal for me sounds like family and sounds like uh, good times. <laughs> uh, to me it means community. A warm meal means a kitchen stock with ingredients to make it. It means a lot to me that I have the capacity uh, to have a nice warm meal. A warm meal can warm more than one cup. One warm meal won't solve food insecurity on the East Coast. But at least it's a start. Well, it is the season for holiday parties. Hundreds of Canadian newcomers in St. John's were throwing a party today, welcoming them to this part of the world. Now, here now sees here. He knows where all of the good parties are, and he wasn't about to miss out on this one. Learning Canadian Christmas traditions is one thing, but in this province, you have to add the classic local customs like mummering. 240 people are enrolled in the ANC's English as a Second Language program. This party is for them and their families. Lunch, activities for the kids, a sing-along, and not to mention presents. The Eastern Edge Quilters Guild donated 45 quilts for new Canadian families. For those leaving difficult circumstances, settling into a new home, and trying to fit in, it's a warm gesture. This time, the Christmas time, and I, I like it because the um, uh, beautiful culture and beautiful people, kind people, and uh, this is very good, yes. Others, like Luma Rabia from Baghdad, grew up participating in the Christian holiday. This is her first Christmas in St. John since arriving in May. The holiday, she says, reminds her of home. Every year I celebrate with the Christian and the place food and uh, their occasion. I'm so uh, glad to participate in this every year. I have a special feelings for this. The experts suggest that if you know a new Canadian, why not, in the spirit of the season, invite them along to a Christmas event? And when they offer a favor in return, ask them to teach you something about their holiday traditions. Cease here, CBC News, St. John's. Yeah, I, apparently that was the captain and I just won a cruise. Well, if you're one of the millions of Canadians who deal with those relentless and annoying scam phone calls, here's something you might actually like to hear. Starting today, telecom companies are required to help block scammers from calling their customers. Thomas Degla has the details. Can you, first of all, stop crying? It's the scam that just won't go away and that Canadians have been capturing and sharing online. A fraudster delivers supposedly serious news. We have found that there were some terrible miscalculations in your text calling. And demands payment or else. The reverse warrant has been issued under your end due to the matter of tax evasion and tax fraud. There's no answer to the problem yet, but this could be step one. A CRTC regulation now coming into effect requiring telecom companies to block numbers like this. Blatantly fake and impossible to call back. This is a very complicated system where we want to make sure that uh, those vast majority of legitimate calls uh, don't get blocked. Bell and Rogers both say they're implementing universal call blocking technology, while TELUS says it's found a better solution known as call filtering for its cell phones. What it won't fix is fake caller ID from real numbers such as this one from the Canada Revenue Agency. A solution to fight that is expected next fall. The Canadian Anti-Fraud Centre says phone scams built users out of more than $24 million in 2019, and this initial measure is a good step. It will have an impact on some of the fraud operations out there, um, but how much will remain to be seen. Anne Murphy took an aggressive approach. Fed up with the fraudsters, she told one, the jig is up knowing Indian police recently arrested dozens running a scam call center targeting Canadians. I said, you're going to be shut down 
And he said, that doesn't matter. He said, we'll lay low for a couple of months and we'll just start up again. Yes, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. It could just be the scam that won't go away. Indeed. That's tax scammers for you. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Toronto. Yeah, guys, uh, now, just to be clear, following what Thomas said, providers are going to need to have a system to automatically block numbers that have more than 15 digits, and Rogers and Bell, they're going to implement call blocking technology. Welcome back. Well, it is Christmas in one St. John's neighborhood until Phil Briffitt's neighborhood switches on the lights. He and his wife started decorating early, and I mean early, back in October. The rest of us are going for Halloween, and they're getting ready for Christmas. And they did this to get ready for the big light show. Just take a look. Hi, uh, I'm Phil Briffitt. Um, this is our house. Uh, we started decorating in October. Uh, there's props probably around 10,000 bulbs spread around the property, front, back, top roof, all around. And uh, it's become a, if not a community, a street thing that we, when we light up, every our neighbors around us light up and it's a, a good feeling for Christmas. It's a full-time job keeping it all going, but we enjoy it and people enjoy it. We had someone, a lady come knock on our door just a couple of nights ago, uh, saying I live in the neighborhood. I uh, didn't realize this was here. Don't know how I miss it. It's a class act. So it makes you feel good that uh, people feel that way and uh, they feel good about it. So it makes us feel good about it as well. Hopefully we can do it for a number of more years yet. We got 20 behind us and I'm not sure I got 20 in front, but we're going to keep going as long as we can. We enjoy it and uh, others enjoy it as well, and that's a good part of Christmas. Better get Muskrat Falls online. Now, gift giving is a big part of holiday traditions at this time of year, but it's not always easy to get everyone on your list exactly what they want. Case in point, Great Britain and the present that it received this month from across the North Sea. It's a spruce that reminds some people of Charlie Brown's Christmas tree. Carolyn Dunn with that story. Behold the Trafalgar Square Christmas tree, an annual gift from Norway. This year it's 25 meters high 
And depending on your perspective, it's either majestic or, well, anemic. Just very sparse. It looks like half the, half the needles are missing off it. Slightly disappointing because I'm afraid that the tree is not quite as good as, you know, as usually is, which is a bit sad. It must be a bit uh, wild because we're coming out of the EU then or something, or something must be happening from the center tree like that. <laughs> The tradition started in 1947 when King Hakun VII gifted Britain the tree for giving him refuge when the Nazis invaded Norway. It has since marked the countdown to Christmas in London, and as such, it has some big fans. I think it's great. It's taken a lot of people a lot of patience and trouble to get it over here and then to erect it over here and everything and then to, to moan about it. I think that's silly. As a gift, it's still a very nice gesture. The good news, when the sun sets and its traditional vertical lights come on, when the carolers start singing, Norway's gift is beautiful by any standard. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, London. Well, now that U.S. President Donald Trump has been impeached in the House of Representatives, the next step is supposed to be a trial in the Senate. But Democrat House Speaker Nancy Pelosi says she may not, may not send the charges over to the upper chamber of Congress right away. The CBC's Megan Fitzpatrick has more from Washington. The nays are 229. The nays are 198. Now that Donald Trump has become the third president in U.S. history to be impeached by the House of Representatives, the Senate has to decide whether he keeps his job. The Senate is tasked with holding a trial, but when that might happen is up in the air. The House has to officially send the two articles of impeachment to the Senate, and that hasn't happened yet. Speaker Nancy Pelosi said today that the next step is to see what the Senate decides about the format of the trial. The length of it and who may be called as witnesses are among the things that need to be decided. And it's not clear when those decisions will be made. While Pelosi didn't commit to sending along the articles of impeachment anytime soon, she did express satisfaction that her party forced Trump into the history books. Seems like people have a spring in their steps because the president was held accountable for his reckless behavior. No one is above the law, and the Constitution is the supreme law of the land. The Republican leader in the Senate, Mitch McConnell, gave a lengthy speech this morning defending Trump and saying his impeachment by the House set the new toxic precedent. He also accused Pelosi and her party of getting cold feet because she didn't immediately send the case to his chamber. Democrats' own actions concede that their allegations are unproven. While the bickering between the two parties and the two chambers carried on, Trump was at the White House weighing in on his impeachment. He wrote on Twitter throughout the morning calling it a hoax and a witch hunt. Then he welcomed Jeff Van Drew to the Oval Office, a Democrat member of the House who last night voted against impeaching the president. Van Drew had signaled last weekend that he intended to switch parties and he followed through on that today. Trump welcomed Van Drew to the party and then shared his thoughts on impeachment. They cheapened the word impeachment. Uh, that should never again happen to another president. And I think you'll see some very interesting things happen over the coming few days and weeks. The White House has said it's confident Trump will be exonerated whenever a trial is held in the Senate and that it's ready to defend the president. Megan Fitzpatrick, CBC News, Washington.
Mr. Penn has a violent history and violent past. Come on, Matthew. Yeah, well, am I going to be rolling on this? Yes. All right. Local news, Philip Penn is back in custody. OK, now yeah. hold on one second before we roll. More jail time for Philip Penn. The whole point of this, this, right? This would be a documentary. So this is about rehabilitation. Do you think he can turn his life around? I know he can. It's hard to rehabilitate people when they're around a bunch of criminals. <laughs> and second chances. And how do you pick yourself up and move forward? All these people that judge my kid, they're all full of shit. It was my fault, like it was not me. Philip is not a monster. I don't look down and I don't judge people for their mistakes and stuff, and I expect the same. Very busy uh, Saturday, Sunday this weekend, the last weekend before the big day, so a lot of interest in your expertise. <laughs> Shopping. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's not even true. <laughs> I just make an accusation. Uh, but obviously people are making their plans now, so yep. how are things looking? Yeah, we, uh, we are on the weekend train, I guess, at this point, and uh, it's looking like that snow that we were talking about a little bit earlier for Friday will continue into, into at least the first okay. half of Saturday. So let's take a look at that future tracker. Uh, you can see that snow there for the Avalon and along the northeast coast, potentially some flurries again uh, continuing along the west coast. Again, this is Friday night into Saturday morning, and you can see that kind of continues into the afternoon on Saturday. Now we do have uh, some activity, it looks like, just along the coastline. But um, as far as snowfall amounts, by Saturday morning, it does look like about five to as much as 10 centimeters could fall uh, for parts of, say, Bonavista and then down through parts of the northern Avalon as well. Here in the metro area, still thinking between two to five centimeters. But uh, again, things could change as we head through the day tomorrow. So certainly keep that in mind. Otherwise, uh, things should generally clear out across Labrador. We can thank a big ridge of high pressure for that. And then uh, things will settle down again across the island. So it's looking quite quiet if you have uh, travel plans on Saturday. Here's a look at your temperatures. Zero degrees hovering around the zero degree mark for St. John's. Minus two for Cornerbrook. Minus one for Port of Basque. Getting back into those double digit lows up through uh, Nain. Minus ten. Same thing for Happy Valley Goose Bay. Plenty of sunshine. Still throwing in the slight chance of some flurries for Lab City though uh, into the afternoon. Now, uh, heading into Sunday, uh, quiet for the most part. We're going to see uh, some increasing cloud, it looks like, for parts of Labrador. Then that snow will move, uh, potentially skirting you. Otherwise, it looks like it'll move a little bit further south. Coastal areas of Labrador still looking at that potential for some sh uh, flurries or light snow. Otherwise, it should be a calm day on Saturday. That cloud cover will move in uh, into Tuesday, which is Christmas Eve, when we're looking at uh, some snow moving across Labrador and uh, not very well agreed upon as to what's going to happen as we head towards Christmas. A number of uh, discrepancies in the models, but uh, this is what this model saying. So we're looking at uh, potentially some snow and maybe even some rain because temperatures look like they're going to be hovering around the zero and maybe even above the zero degree mark by the time uh, next week rolls around. So certainly going to keep an eye on that forecast, but overall uh, hovering between zero and minus four really uh, through the weekend with that chance of some sunshine and the also the chance of some flurries uh, in the mix there. So for central Newfoundland, you're looking at about uh, minus five for Sunday and then dipping or rather climbing, I suppose, uh, for both Monday and Tuesday hovering around the minus one degree mark and again have those flurries in the forecast right now. Generally gray for western Newfoundland except some sun possible on Sunday. At least a few peaks of sun in the mix for you and then up through Labrador. You're looking at uh, some sunshine thanks to that big ridge of high pressure. But also with that we always see a cool down. So minus 10 minus 13 overnight lows uh, nearing the minus 20 degree mark and then warming up as we head into Tuesday. Same thing for Western Labrador sunshine for Sunday and then uh, staying in the minus teens through Monday. This one shouldn't be too hard to figure out where it is. Wow, Christmas gift came early. Probably one of my favorite spots to go to. No kidding, great <laughs> shot. It's a beautiful shot. I'll tell you where this is too when we come back.
Welcome back. Well, extreme cold warnings are in effect for several provinces today, but mm -hmm. Maybe not as cold as what they're experiencing in Yellowknife. Let me tell you, mm -hmm. my Instagram profile has told me that this is how cold it is in okay. Yellowknife. Okay, apparently minus 41 in your old stomping grounds? Yeah, it is uh, pretty chilly. That's mm -hmm. pretty cold. And uh, my friend from the north, Garrett Hinchy, shows us just how cold it is. Everyone, Garrett Hinchy here at CBC North. And my producers wanted me to come outside and talk to you about how cold it is here in Yellowknife. You want to know how cold it is, producers? This water turns to steam. These bubbles are falling like rocks. Look at this cord. <laughs> Power steering fluid on the ground. The snow hurts my ears. It's minus 41. How cold is minus 41? How cold is... My phone just died. <laughs> Yeah, when Siri bites the dust, you know, it's cool. Oh, That's fabulous. That was something I constantly, uh, that constantly happened was my phone dying yeah. or uh, the snow hurting your ears. That's hilarious. Right. That was really good. Excellent. Yep. Good stuff. All right. Absolutely. So here's a take a look at our uh, weather photo of the day. Cape Spear. No doubt. Obviously. And Madden sent us that great shot. Thank you so much for sending that in. Not quite as cold as minus 41. But no. uh, if you have any weather photos you'd like to share with us, send them to uh, nlphotos at cbc.ca. Won't complain about the cold again. Nope. We'll see you tomorrow. Good night. Minus 41.